Good morning. And Merry Christmas to you. I'm so, so thrilled that you're with us this morning. Uh, of course, we've been uh, trying to emphasize, uh, it's not certainly original with us, it's original with God's Word, but we've been trying to emphasize the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the Scripture reminds us in Matthew chapter 1, she, that is Mary, will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. We are so grateful for the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And for those of us that know him as Lord and Savior, we understand exactly what Emmanuel is. God with us means. We celebrate more than a babe in a manger. We celebrate a Savior, the King of all the universe. And so I trust that today as we sing, as we listen to the Word, as we hear a couple of testimonies, that one thing will ring true. That because Emmanuel came to us, we are rescued. And we testify to that fact. Would you stand, please, as we sing this morning?
back for a visit. They have been among our membership for years and years, and uh, the Lord has uh, placed them temporarily, for a couple of years anyway, in Brazil. But they're here uh, for the holidays. And first of all, would you welcome them back? Wave folks in the back. Excellent. So glad to have you. I miss the, the English accent around here. So folks, put your English ears on. That is, as Rob Gibbs would say, proper English, the King's English. Rob, come lead us in prayer. God bless you, my friend. Please pray with me. Gracious Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for allowing us this time of worship. We invoke you to come into this place and to have your Holy Spirit fill our hearts with a burning passion to know you more. May we use this time to your glory, to honor you and give thanks for your continued blessings. It is a time that we are free to sing praises to your holy name to be enlightened by the message of your word to us through expositional teaching of our pastor. Keep his and our minds free from distraction and moments of wandering so we can fully focus on you and your words of direction for our lives. Lord, may our worship of song be pleasing to you and sweet music to your ears. And corporately, we ask you all these things through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Take a moment and greet one another, won't you? take a seat. We have a couple of folks, uh, Raj Kotapaka and uh, Jenny Seacott are going to come and quickly share their testimony of faith in the Lord Jesus, and then we're going to vote on their membership. So Raj, wherever you are, yes, you can come forward. Jenny, come on up. And Raj, since you're closer, we'll let you start right from here and share your testimony. Come on up, my friend. Good morning. Uh, my name is Rajinder. Uh, I was born in a Hindu family. Uh, when I was five years old, my mother, my mother was suffering from health problems. Uh, one of my neighbors used to go to church, and they invited our family. To, uh, our, our family. So we started going to church with them, and we came to know about Jesus Christ. Uh, so my, after my mother accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, uh, she, cured, she cured from the health problems. Uh, so we used to... Uh, so I used to go to, go to church with my mother, listening to, listening to gospel, but I haven't as, uh, accepted Jesus Christ as my savior. But when I was 10 years old, so God talked to me through through His words. Then I understood God. I understood that Jesus came to this world and died for my sin and rose again. So I accept, accepted Jesus Christ as my savior and baptized by immersion. So when I was two, 12 years old, I met with an accident. Uh, luckily, God saved me, and I uh, came out with accident with very minor injuries. Uh, God helped me throughout my career, uh, studies, and uh, and studies. And uh, I got married in 2013. Uh, God helped me to come to US in 2014. So I came to uh, know about Bayan from my, one of my uh, uh, dear friend. Uh, it's a good, it's a good, it's a good place to grow in a faith. Uh, uh, please, uh, please pray. Uh, please pray. Please remember me and my family in your prayer. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jenny Seacott. I'm the wife of Mark Seacott. 
Uh, I grew up in a Christian family where the gospel was prevalent and uh, my family was very, very active in serving at church. I was saved at the age of four, but I would have told you then, I was almost five. And it was in the February of 1993. And uh, being as young as I was, um, my mother really wanted to make sure that I knew what I wanted to do. And so she started uh, grilling me on the doctrine of salvation. And to the point where I looked at her and go, Mom, do you not want me to get saved? And of course her reaction was, no, no, I want you to do this. I just want to make sure you know what you're doing. So I got saved that day uh, and, uh, and was led to the Lord by my mother. Uh, sometime around the second grade, I was uh, in Sunday school, and the teacher said something about believers' baptism and it being an act of obedience and a public testimony of one's uh, serious decision to follow Christ. And I was rather upset. Nobody had said that to me prior that I was supposed to do this. So I marched up to my mother, and I go, um, I want to get baptized. And so, she, again, she asked me about the doctrine of baptism, and um, I, you know, confirmed to her that I knew what I was, I knew what I wanted to do. So she took me to the pastor, who did that again, and I sat through and listened to him explain baptism, going, I know, I just want to get baptized because I'm supposed to, because, because, because. So <laughs> eventually I, 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 I was baptized, um, in, in the second grade. Uh, since then, um, I have seen a lot of growth in, in working away of things in my life. Uh, because I was so young, obviously there's no, you know, I was horrible, although I was the screaming two-year-old, but I, I was informed you all won't hold that against me because that was before I was saved. So, <laughs> um, but uh, I've seen a lot of growth, and I've, I've had my share of, of struggles, and I've had my moments of being a downright Pharisee, and I, God's worked with me a lot on not putting up my list of, well, this is what I'm doing, and you're not doing those things, so you're not as good as me. He's really worked with me on that. And I've had my moments of, of wanting to take things out of his hand, but he's really worked with me on just trusting him to arrange the future and me just sitting there going, okay, Lord, you've got me in this place. This is what you want me to do, and that's what I'm going to do. And not worry about what's going to come because he's got it, and I don't. And I've learned to really trust him a lot more. I'm probably not there yet, but a lot more than I used to be with that kind of thing. And after 22 years, if any of you are sitting on the fence, I can confidently tell you that the Christian walk is totally worth it. And if I had to do it all again, I would because I don't regret one second. All right, the elders make the motion that we accept Raj Kotapaka and Jenny Seacott into membership. Is there a second anywhere? Uh, Mark Seacott. <laughs> it's the first smart thing, second smart thing you've ever done. Okay. Thank you. All in favor, say amen. 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 We're thrilled. Uh, think about this. You, in the space of four or five minutes, you've heard the proper English dialect, you've heard the Indian English dialect, then you heard what I call the best English dialect. <laughs> isn't that outstanding? I mean, isn't it amazing what God's church, who God's church is, that the gospel goes to the nations. And uh, we are so blessed to see that here. We don't deserve it. And we're so grateful for uh, the folks that the Lord has given us. After all, this is God's church, not ours. So we hope that we are good stewards, you and I, uh, of his ministry here. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you, has, you have sent to us a Savior. Help us to recognize that he is our Savior, and by that assurance, cease from our own struggles and lean upon the one that you have sent to deliver us. We thank you that while you had no obligation to us at all, that you contended to show, that you condescended to show us your mercy. We have no claim on you. We were your enemies. We were in rebellion. We were of ourselves hopeless 
you have been our hope. You have been our salvation. We thank you for your gospel. We thank you for this gospel day. In this day, any sinner may throw himself upon the mercies of a living and compassionate Father. We thank you for this land. We thank you for this place. We thank you for this people. We pray for the people of Berean. We pray that as the gospel goes out to their ears this morning, that it will go, it will enter their hearts by your Holy Spirit and change them. Cause them to see you anew. And in that revelation, see themselves anew. And in that moment, realize how much, how very, very much they owe to you. We pray for the children of Berean Baptist Church. We pray that each of us would undertake anew to minister to them and shepherd to them and bring assist you in bringing forth from them a new generation of those who will worship you and glorify your name. We pray for our preacher as he will come to us in this morning. We know him and we thank you for the blessing that he is to this people. And we know the talents that you have given him and we know the discipline that he enforces in his own life so we know that he is prepared but we pray that when he should come to us he will come to us not in his own preparation but he will come to us purely holy and only seeking your glory to efface himself and to exalt you through your precious word we pray these things in Jesus name amen Of all the songs that I've written over the last 10 or 12 years, the one we're about to play was Mike Handel's favorite. Um, Mike was always such an encouraging, encouragement to me in songwriting. Um, so I just wanted to mention that because I miss him. And uh, so I will play this song this morning to the honor and glory of God, but also to the loving memory of our friend and brother, Mike Handel. Um, a few weeks ago, we began Advent, which is, uh, I mentioned then, a season of hopeful anticipation. Advent invited us to ask the questions, who will rescue us, who will redeem us, who will save us? Now, Christmas invites us to rejoice in the answer. God is in the manger. The great rescue mission has begun, and there is wonderful assurance and truth here. Unto us a child is born, a son is given, not deserved, not earned, but given. And he will save his people from their sins. He won't bow out. He won't try and then fail. He will do it. So do not be afraid. These are good tidings of great joy. Christmas is the beginning of It Is Finished. The first breath of God's last word of forgiveness and new life. All across the distant shores, we come in steps to heaven's doors, the dawn has come. Over all the plains and desert sands, across the street and in foreign lands, the dawn has come. In the heart and soul of humankind, the sickness from the dawn of time, the cure has come. From the heights of joy to deepest pain, where mortals and their idols reign, a king has come. Thank you. 
This morning is taken from 1st Timothy chapter 3 verses 14 through 16. I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed we confess is a mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Well, I hope your Christmas has been a wonderful time when you have joined together with family and traditions and gathering together with the people of God as well during this season and focusing on that which is most essential in our experience during this time of year. Life is full of mysteries. Seems everyone loves a good mystery. Mystery seems to be a big seller in our, in our time. There are so-called unexplained natural phenomena that are, that are deemed to be great mysteries, such as UFOs and crop circles, the Bermuda Triangle. This is why I've never gone to Bermuda. <laughs> the Loch Ness Monster, right? I, Bigfoot. Don't you just wish they would find one? And, you know, and put this all the rest. Here's, here's, this is it. This is Bigfoot, you know. But it remains a mystery. Continues to fascinate people around the world. Every now and then I'll be surfing through the TV programs. You come across a program where, about these subjects. Either UFOs or, or Bigfoot or, or Loch Ness Monster or something or, or whatever. And, and it continues to fascinate people. Somebody must watch these programs, right? Because they wouldn't put them on if people didn't watch them. Well, there are, there are literary mi- mysteries as well. The mystery genre in books and movies continues to be a staple of the entertainment business. Charles Dickens, Edgar Allan Poe, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Agatha Christie just get recycled over and over again. New generations are exposed to it. New iterations, you know, of those same themes. We love a good mystery. Then there are the... the the mystery, natural mysteries of wonder, 
The poet says there is the mystery of a young man with a fair maiden. The mystery of the universe as one gazes into a star-speckled sky. The mystery of, of love. What exactly is it that makes a grown man act like such an idiot at times when he falls in love? Who knows? It's a mystery. Well, they, these are mysterious things that escape the full understanding of thoughtful people. But in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, we are told of a mystery that is so incredible that it is called a great mystery. Paul writes, beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. The incredible statement made in verse 16 these statements are placed in the context of the book of 1 Timothy. Now, 1 Timothy is the first of three books or pastoral epistles in which Paul is instructing his young charges, Timothy and Titus, these young men in the ministry. His instructions are far-ranging, touching the essential elements of church ministry. That is the larger context. Here, the immediate context is in verses 14 and 15. For Paul says, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of truth. Because the King James version translated uh, this house of God instead of household of God. Many generations thought that Paul was talking about how we ought to behave in church. That is when we gather together in the church building. How should we behave in the church? Don't run in church. No speaking aloud. Uh, don't chew gum. Don't clip your nails during communion. That has happened, folks. <laughs> Believe me, that has happened. Uh, uh, don't, you know, men, remove your hats. Uh, all, all kinds of church etiquette that has developed over the years. And sometimes people have thought, well, this is how, this is what Paul is talking about. He's talking about behaving oneself well in the church services or in the church in, in the house of God. But Paul is not speaking of church etiquette. Paul means to instruct us in terms of what kind of lives we ought to live and how we are to go about ministry in the household of faith, the family of God. The infinitive here is translated behave. It is used of lifestyle or manner of life. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3, Paul uses it of our former lifestyle, among whom... We all once lived. We once lived in the passions of our flesh. Same word here. In 2 Corinthians 1.12, he writes, Our conscience testifies that we have conducted ourselves. There's our, our word. Conducted ourselves in the world and especially in our relations with you in the, in the holiness and sincerity that are from God. So Paul says that the reason that he's writing these things is so that proper behavior, proper conduct, proper lifestyle as, as a member of the family of God might be defined. Now, we don't like that in America. We are independent Americans, and nobody tells us what to do. We don't like to submit ourselves to the authority of anyone else, especially to voluntarily submit our, uh, uh, you know, ourselves to the authority. Now, we may have to do that to the government. We may have to do that to the IRS. We might have to do that to the police officer in the street. But we do not voluntarily submit ourselves to anyone else's authority because we're independent Americans and nobody tells us how to live. And many people, many Christians today or professing Christians today say, my church doesn't tell me how to live. Let me say without fear of contradiction from the word of God, if your church isn't telling you how to live, you're in the wrong church. 
That's what the church is supposed to do. And Paul affirms that here in these verses. You see, if all your church is doing is, is how to find personal fulfillment, teaches you how to find personal fulfillment, or how to have you know, loving relationships inside uh, the home, or how to have financial freedom, or the latest coping me mechanism uh, uh, that given to us from psychology, that's the wrong church. It is the job of the local church to teach you what kind of lifestyle, what kind of conduct you should have as a member of the household of faith, the church. And the church is designed to keep you accountable to that lifestyle. We have made much this morning of membership. We have had two people give testimony to come into the membership of this church. We have recognized individuals who have committed themselves long-term uh, to membership. These are people that have, have, have weathered the highs and the lows and the difficulties and the blessings and the changing face of the church and all of those things and maintained faithful to membership, maintained their accountability to this local body, maintained accountability to a set of shepherds, pastors, who are appointed of God to watch over their souls, remained committed to a, to a set of doctrines, the teachings of the gospel, and, and have said through their membership and through their behavior, I'm accountable to all that. By and large, that's that. If I had to pick one primary reason why people don't join a church, why people like the idea of going to a church without accountability, without any strings attached, that's why people don't want to become members of a local church. And we resist that, we fight against that. We teach and preach against that. We make no apology for the fact that if you're coming to Berean, we expect you to eventually, if you're a believer, to become a member. And if you can't become a member here, go somewhere where you can be a member. Go somewhere where you can be accountable because God never intended his people to be lone rangers accountable only to themselves. Or as they would say, it's just me and God. Right? It doesn't have anything to do with y'all. And that's a concept foreign to the scriptures. Now, two introductory points I would like to make here. One is Paul is not talking about a mystery in terms of a thing that cannot be known. It's just unknowable. Or that is so confusing that it defies explanation. That's not what he's talking about when he's talking about a mystery. A mystery in New Testament terminology is not something unknowable, but something that has before this time been unrevealed, but is now uncovered. It has now come to light. Paul calls, for instance, the church a mystery, not because it is a concept unknowable, Jews and Gentiles together in one body with Christ as its head, it's not a concept that, is, that, that can't be understood or that's unknowable, but it was, it was veiled, as it were, until these times, these New Testament times. Secondly, Paul is not using the term godliness to denote something unknowable. That, that is to say, Paul is not saying righteous behavior is a great mystery. We, we just can't understand how to live righteously. No, he's not talking about that. But if he's not saying that, what is he saying? Well, Paul follows this statement about this great mystery with six truths that describe the mystery of godliness. All of these statements prove that the mystery of godliness is none other than Jesus Christ himself. Note the first truth. He appeared in a body. He was manifested in the flesh. That's what we have been celebrating here during this Christmas season, the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the coming in flesh of God himself. Right off the bat, Paul personalizes the mystery of godliness to be a person. 
One who appeared in a body. The mystery of godliness here is explained first in the truth of this incarnation of Christ as the revelation of the true and perfect godliness. Great mystery. You see, because in the Old Testament, the enfleshment of God in the person of Jesus Christ was a mystery. Only in the New Testament is it now clearly revealed, and all believers agree without controversy that this is a great and incredible concept never imagined. God with us. God, one of us. That's incredible. This, this was a radical answer to the Old Testament question of how, how can God be both the holy offended one and the merciful saving one at the same time. You see, Old Testament theologians were on the horns of a dilemma. How would it be solved? How could God be holy and merciful at the same time? How, how could these two concepts come together? How could God be, as Paul would put it in Romans, both the just and the justifier at the same time? Well, God did it through a concept that was beyond the thinking of any human being before the time that he actually did it in the person of Jesus Christ. That's the incarnation, the God-man. Now, this, this, this concept is second nature to us now. We've, we've been taught it. We've, it's been drilled into us. We've seen it in Scripture, and it's not... It's not new to us now, but before Jesus Christ came in the incarnation, this, this, was, this was not even conceived of. This, this was not anticipated that God would do this in the way that he did it. The God-man. How would we truly know godliness if not for the incarnate Savior coming to exegete God, to explain God, to unfold who he is. So the first aspect of the mystery of godliness is God manifested in the flesh. Now, remember, Paul is telling us about this, right? In context, he's telling us about this mystery of godliness for what reason? So that we would know how to conduct ourselves in the household of God. We are to be the incarnation of Christ in this world. We are to reflect the godliness that was Jesus Christ. We are living letters, Paul would tell us, known and read of all men. We would represent Christ. We would be his ambassadors. This is how we are to live in the household of faith, how as Christ lived, in righteousness, in self-sacrifice, in holiness, in service to others. Well, the second truth is this. He was vindicated by the Spirit. Vindicated by the Spirit. The word vindicated here is a Greek word, dikaiou, which means justified or declared righteous. And the one doing this was the Spirit. Now, it's interesting to know that the, whole, that the whole life that Jesus lived and all the people with whom he worked declared him to be righteous. 1 John 2, 1, John calls him Jesus Christ the righteous. So John declared him righteous. Paul said he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. So call, uh, Paul called him righteous. The writer to the Hebrews said he was without sin, Hebrews 4, 15. And holy, undefiled, innocent, Hebrews 7, 26. Jesus himself said with confidence, who can convict me of sin? But even though all his co-laborers and even he himself declared his righteousness, he wasn't vindicated 
until the Spirit declared him to be the righteous one. How and when did the Spirit do that? Well, Romans 1.4 tells us it was at the time of the resurrection. Paul tells us that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the Spirit of holiness. That is when Jesus was vindicated. That is when he was declared righteous. The mystery of godless, godless, uh, godliness is not just that he was incarnated. That not, as, ma- as amazing as that is, that would not be enough. This mystery of godliness also includes the fact that he was vindicated as righteous by his resurrection from the dead. We too are vindicated that we have this standing of righteousness. When we conduct ourselves in a way in keeping with his righteous living. You know, when we baptize folks, we like to say, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection, to do what? Walk in newness of life. And so that's our calling. That's our connection. We are to walk in righteousness. We should be vindicated by the Spirit. The ultimate vindication of us will be the ultimate vindication that the Spirit used to vindicate Jesus. It'll be our resurrection. Our ultimate vindication is when we are resurrected with Christ. Okay? We have that standing now. We have that promise now. But that will, that will complete itself at the time when we ourselves experience the resurrected state. Jesus Christ was vindicated by the Spirit. And this does not mean that we live perfect lives, but certainly that our trajectory of life is one of righteousness and not worldliness. The vindication of the Spirit in our lives is the lives that we live in Christ to ultimate resurrection. Note a third truth. He was seen by angels. Now, this does not simply mean that angels saw him. It means that they attended to him. The word in the Greek means to visit or to observe or to be attended to. Jesus was, throughout his earthly ministry, attended to by angels. There's several examples of this in the New Testament. They were there, obviously, at his birth. They ministered to him during the temptation. They strengthened him in Gethsemane. At his death and resurrection, which is the focal point of this passage, angels observed him. Two angels attended his ascension. This this all indicated the divine approval of the incarnate Messiah. Unlike the current representation of angels that we have in the popular media, you know, please do not get your theology from television shows or or popular movies because they will lead you astray uh, almost every time. But angels in the New Testament were, were... Indications of God's working, administering, overseeing the life of the Messiah. Nothing was more significant than the earthly life and ministry of Jesus. So he was not only just visually seen by angels, he was attended to by angels. This is another mark of the mystery of godliness. That his life was overseen by the ministers of God. His human life was not lived without oversight from on high. This is a part of the mystery of godliness. The life of a believer is not lived independently or unilaterally or without supervision from on high. We conduct ourselves in the household of faith understanding and knowing that we are supervised. We are attended to 
God has not left us on our own. Sometimes, yes, in rare occasions, he attends to us by angels, even angels unaware. But he attends or, or oversees us and attends us always with his spirit. He has given us his spirit so that our lives are not lived by our own wisdom. Our lives are not lived working out things according to the best way we can do it. He has given us the spirit of God. He has given us spiritual oversight. He does that through the indwelling spirit. He does that through the word of God. He does that through the church. This is spiritual oversight, folks. This is a, this is a, and we talk about this often in the elder room. This, this is a tremendous responsibility. This is a heavy responsibility that God has given weak, sinful human men to oversee the spiritual welfare of God's people. This is one of the ways that God mediates his oversight of his people. And when we neglect that, when we ignore that, when we move outside of that and say, I don't want to be accountable to that. I don't, I, I don't want to be under the authority. I, Terry, you're just a sinful man. Yes, I am. You're no better than I am. You're right, I'm not. But I have been called to do this. God has given me gifts necessary to the carrying out of this task along with the other elders. Spiritual oversight. God is attending to you by this. Even as the Lord Jesus Christ was attended by angels. The fourth truth here is he was preached among the nations. Jesus commanded his disciples go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, 8, you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. There was, there was to be no nation left without the gospel message. Jesus was then and is still being preached among the nations. We are those who continue to manifest this mystery when we preach Christ among the nations. The gospel of Jesus was not meant to stay with the Jews. It was meant for all people. Now, this was a mystery in the sense that the Jews, they did not see themselves that way. They, they misunderstood that they were supposed to be this cloistered group, this special group that, that shut out the rest of the world. We were God's people, and, and, and therefore we, we need to stay separate from Gentiles and, and make sure that we don't, we don't uh, interact with them or, or, or bring them in. And so this mystery is unfolded in the New Testament, the gospel, to all the nations, to all peoples of the earth. This is how we ought to conduct ourselves in the household of faith. We ought to be witnessing, we ought to be proclaiming, we ought to be, pro uh, 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 we ought to be preaching Christ among the nations. But here's a fifth truth, which is connected to this fourth truth. He was believed on in the world believed on in the world. This is amazing. Many prophets and religious people have been preached among the nations, haven't they? But Jesus has been believed on in the world. Even though we preach this incredible story about God becoming flesh, about the God-man, about the makeup of God as being Trinitarian, and this God-man coming to die for the sins of the world and being raised again from the dead. And people believe it. How does that happen? It only happens by the power of the Holy Spirit convincing people that this is the truth. Listen, no other religious leader has, has proclaimed this. The, the concept of the God-man... Nobody. The concept of the Trinity? Nope. The concept of God in flesh? Nope. Resurrection from the dead? Nope. Mohammed is still in the grave, folks. But Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And he's been believed on in the world. 
this incredible, unbelievable story is believed on in the world. People in every nation among all races cutting across social and economic strata, these people come to believe in Jesus as the Lamb of God. It's a great mystery. This can only be accomplished through the convincing and convicting power of the Holy Spirit and our conduct is to be the conduct of those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot be just like everyone else because we believe on Jesus. We cannot live any way we want to live according to the dictates of our flesh because we have believed on Jesus. That's what it means to believe in Jesus. To be his. To be transformed. To be changed. We don't, we don't we don't take on the philosophies of the world. We don't embrace the sinful lifestyles of the world. We are a separate and holy people to glorify his name in all the earth. Those that have believed on Jesus in this world are part of this mystery of godliness. And finally, there's a sixth truth he was taken up in glory. The King James Version translates it this way, taken up into glory. This, this led some to think that what is being spoken of here is the destination. Glory being a synonym for heaven. He was taken up into heaven. The correct translation is found in our ESV and several other modern translations which says he was taken up in glory or in the process of glory. He wasn't taken to glory. He was taken up in glory. What this means is that the ascension of Jesus Christ was an act of great glorification of Christ. Acts 1, 9 and 10 says, after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on and a cloud received him out of their sight. As they were gazing intently into the sky while he was departing, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. And they also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Hebrews 1.3 says, When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. You know, in Western Christianity, we, we do not make much of the ascension. I, I have to admit, we do not make much of, of the ascension. When I went to Russia in, I think it was 2004, uh, for the first time, we were working in Krasnodar at that time, and it was, it was in April. And I was, as their custom is there, if you're, if you're a visiting pastor, they, they ask you to preach. You don't know what you're going to preach on. Uh, they just say, okay, now you, you give the next message. They usually have three messages in a sermon. You give the next message. And so they came to me and they said, we want you to preach on the ascension. And I have, to, I have to admit, I had never preached a message on the ascension. Now, I'd mentioned the ascension from time to time, of course, but I never preached on the, on the ascension. Well, in Russia... They have Ascension Day. And Ascension Day is like Christmas or Easter. It, 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 it is, it's a big thing for them. And so, you know, providentially, as God would have it, I was actually there to teach the book of Acts. And I had all of my message on the books, book of Acts. And so I, I got into Acts chapter 1, and I, and I, and I kind of, you know... Uh, Made, made a sermon out of that and, and, and preached uh, on the ascension. First time I ever preached on the ascension. But it was then that I began to realize that the ascension needs to play a much bigger part in our celebrations and our observances of what it means to be Christian. This was the moment of, of the glorification, the the. the the, 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 the approval of God to the extent that God now takes him 
in great glory, in manifest glory, and now places him at the, at the throne of God, the right hand of the majesty on high. A great moment of glorification. What a mystery. What a mystery. That a human, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, is to receive all glory. Every glory that is due to the Father is due to the Son. He is to be glorified just as we would glorify God the Father. That is the kind of behavior to which we are called in the household of faith. Lives that bring glory to Christ. So how are we to behave ourselves in the household of faith? Well, are we supposed to wear ties? Are we supposed to remove our hats when we're indoors? Are we supposed to avoid chewing gum? How are we supposed to behave ourselves in the household of faith? We are to model our lives after the mystery of godliness, Jesus Christ. In six short statements, the gospel is clearly laid out. The mystery of godliness is that Christ was manifested in the flesh through Jesus Christ. Jesus was vindicated in the spirit through the resurrection. He was attended to through his whole life by angels. He was preached among the nations with the result that many believed in how ultimately he was glorified in being received up into heaven, signifying God's acceptance of him and his work. Folks, this is our charter. This is our outline. This mystery of godliness, Jesus Christ, gives us the cue of how we are to behave ourselves in the household of faith into which we have been spiritually born. We do not have the prerogative to live any way we choose. We live and serve at the pleasure of the king. There was a program on years ago called, not so many years ago, but 10 years ago, maybe called The West Wing. And that was a recurring theme in that, uh, in that TV show when his subordinates would say to him, I serve at the pleasure of the president. Well, I tell you something that is more significant than that. You serve at the pleasure of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, not some mere president, but the King of Kings. This time of year is a fitting time to recommit ourselves to that ethic, to that lifestyle, to that pursuit of godliness to which we are called. Please stand for this benediction, if you will. great indeed we confess is the mystery of godliness he was manifested in the flesh vindicated by the spirit seen by angels proclaimed among the nations believed on in the world taken up into glory father god send us forth this new year to manifest the mystery of godliness found in jesus christ our lord and savior now unto him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen and amen. Let's have a great new year. Oh, Raj and Jenny, would you come? We want to welcome you into our membership here.